Good everybody and welcome to our Wildlife for Lunch webinar. Today's presentation is about wildscapes and it is presented by Kelly Simol. She is an urban wildlife biologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife. Today's Wildlife for Lunch is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition, Inc. and is hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And with that, I'm going to bring up Kelly's presentation here and I will pass the ball over to you. So uh, go ahead. Thank you, Eleanor, I appreciate it. This is Kelly Seymour, I'm with Texas Parks and Wildlife as the urban wildlife biologist stationed in the Central Texas area. And I thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to participating in this webinar and, uh, and hearing everybody's questions. And this is a different format for me. So I, I, um, I normally do a very interactive <laughs> presentation. So I'm hoping that we can um, replicate some of that interactivity too as we go along. So please don't be afraid to to uh, write in the chat box or raise your hand or um, respond. Um, and Eleanor, yesterday there was a yes or no. Oh, over here um, on the right-hand side of your, um, I guess the the menu area where it says chat. There's also there's a hand that you can raise, but there's also this little um, um, speech balloon with a check box in it. And that's to give feedback. And if you click that real quick, you'll see that there's a, a way to say yes, no, uh, tell me that I'm going too fast or too slow. I mean, of course, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of applause and laughter, but so you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, but really what I'm really interested in are those first four buttons to, uh, to allow this to be a little bit more interactive. Okay, so today's program is going to be on Texas wildscaping. And, and wildscaping refers to the way that we might um, landscape or areas for the benefit of us. Um, we, we certainly want things to be aesthetically pleasing and, and happy for us, but also for the benefit of wildlife and to remember that wildlife need habitat in order to, to survive. And of course, when I'm talking about wildlife, I'm talking about wildlife that are appropriate to your area, whether it's uh, birds and butterflies, hummingbirds, lizards, toes, whatever it is that you um, would like to see more of in your in your yards and gardens and, and everywhere. So we're not talking about creating habitat for uh, cougars, <laughs> unless perhaps you have a whole lot of acreage out in West Texas. So when I say habitat, what exactly is it that I mean? Um, a lot of times people have this understanding of habitat and it's perfectly reasonable. Habitat is where wildlife live, and sometimes people think that wildlife should be living way far away from people, um, not, not around our houses. So a lot of times this image is what we have of uh, um, habitat that is in Central Texas especially, um, and that is large areas of unbroken land where wildlife can roam free. So do you think that this, so here's the first interactivity, do you think this is wildlife habitat? Eleanor, I'm looking for um, responses in the little list, and I'm sure, oh, there we go, there's some. So yeah, I get to see what you say, so please do say something. Yes, no, maybe so. And now we've got about a 50-50 split. <laughs> there we go. There's somebody chatting also in the window. That works out well, too. Anyway, yeah, this is habitat. Habitat is an area that wildlife can obtain food, water, and shelter. And so you can see the structure of native plants and grasses and uh, rain up in the clouds, hopefully falling to the earth eventually. Sometimes uh, it happens in Central Texas. And that provides the elements of habitat for many different species of wildlife. How about this? It's big, it's beautiful. What do you think? Wildlife habitat or maybe not so much? <laughs> Thank you for responding because otherwise it, it, it's so silent over here, I feel like I'm talking to myself. So thank you for responding. Okay, so um, yeah, I, so is this habitat, does it provide food, water, and shelter for wildlife? Well, a lot of people will take a look at those 
beautiful, gorgeous plants and would say, yeah, I mean, that's nectar, right? That's, that's, it's green and it's really cool. So this happens to be a place up in uh, Victoria, British Columbia. It's called Bouchard Gardens. And it is absolutely stunningly gorgeous. Um, it's a reclaimed um, uh, rock quarry, interestingly enough. So it used to be a, a, just a wasteland. So it's certainly better than it was, especially from a uh, heat island effect uh, point of view. But, but yeah, most of those plants that I see in there are cultivated. They're highly cultivated. And what I mean by that is people have taken a, a plant that they like out in nature and they've um, accentuated certain characteristics through breeding that they like. So usually we accentuate that with, uh, we, we accentuate bloom, so it's a great big gorgeous blooms or, or interesting foliage or an interesting growth habit, but very rarely do we ever cultivate a plant for its nectar quality or its pollen quality. And those are the kind of things that wildlife are looking for. In fact, a lot of times cultivars have been, have been bred specifically to be sterile. That is, they don't even produce a fruit or a viable flower or seeds. And that makes them almost entirely useless for wildlife. So I visited this place about 20 years ago and it was insanely gorgeous. It was really, really pretty. But I have to tell you, I didn't see any butterflies, and I should have. Um, I should have seen butterflies. I should have seen some hummingbirds. I should have seen lots of songbirds. Uh, but I just didn't see a whole lot of life. And so this place, while gorgeous, um, is not really all that good for attracting wildlife. Okay, so what about this? It's pretty enough. I mean, it's a different aesthetic. But it's tiny. It's on a quarter acre in central Austin. Um, what do you think? Again, Eleanor reminds us how to respond. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I'm getting some private responses. Wonderful. And everybody knows that this is this is my you know, my trick question, right? It's, I, I don't do any trick questions, but <laughs> this is as close as I get. So yeah, it's only a quarter acre, it's in central Austin, but yeah, absolutely, it's habitat. Look at all those native plants look in, inside the gardens. Um, and also, perhaps, this, oh, I should have, I should have looked at this earlier. Let's see, let me make a circle there. Look, the, these right here, those signs might give you a real big clue. <laughs> those signs are a uh, wildscape and uh, wildscape certification sign and a National Wildlife Federation sign um, that certifies it as a wildlife habitat. Now, it's aesthetically, it is a different aesthetic than some people might like. Um, it's, I think it's gorgeous and it's a lot of fun and it's full of life. It is full of hummingbirds. It is full of butterflies. It is full of songbirds. It is a joyful, garden, if you can say that. And I have to tell a little story real quick. The reason I went to go visit this garden is because it was reported to the Homeowners Association as a rank and noxious um, yard. And they were trying to force the land, the, the homeowner to cut down the, uh, the plants they're in. So what they required is somebody to go visit it and, and say whether it was in fact rank and noxious. So I was the person who got the got the privilege of going out and taking a tour and and, uh, and listing the, all the different uh, plants that I found and whether or not they were fire hazard or pest uh, uh, harboring or, or anything like that. And I I was delighted to say no that they that, that it was not any sort of hazard to the neighborhood the way that they maintained it. But anyway, um, interestingly enough, the Spanglers is the Spanglers. And they um, they engaged in a conversation with their neighborhood, and they engaged in a conversation with their their neighbors specifically, and were very friendly and kind as they always are, and um, educated their their fellow neighbors about what they were trying to do and why they were doing it. Took them tours and brought them lemonade when they were around and visited a lot, and it it turned the whole neighborhood 180 degrees. And so the next year they received the, the uh, Yard of the Year Award for that uh, neighborhood, which I think is a pretty cool um, change of heart. 
Okay, so now that we know what habitat is, uh, well, what habitat looks like, let's look at what it is. Habitat really is um, just providing those things that we all need to survive, that is food, water, and shelter. Shelter for adults, uh, from weather and from predators, and shelter for nestlings as well. And it could be done on any size habitat that you're, any size land that you have. This is another quarter acre or probably um, half acre um, urban property. It hosts a variety of native species of plants and also a wide variety of native um, wildlife. But when you're creating your habitat, it's really important to re remember that nothing stays the sta same. Nothing is static. Everything changes. And um, it, so, so I say that to say this, you're never finished. <laughs> you may want to put out a great habitat and you may be really happy with it one year, but understand that things are going to change the next year and there's a reason for it. We know that it, it's pretty obvious to us that plants will respond to the environment. We know, for example, that, oops, there we go. We know that um, you don't have prickly pear. Well, actually, prickly pear grows about anywhere, doesn't it? You don't have palm trees up in North Texas um, because it's just not the right environment for them. So we know that the, the plants happen in the environment where they get the right soils, where they get the right rainfall, where they get the right temperatures. We know that environment responds to plants, don't we? We know that if you remove plants from an ecosystem, you'll um, see erosion start to occur. You'll start to see changes in the um, streams and rivers nearby because the soil is flowing into those rivers. You'll see um, changes in the temperature of the soil. We know that plants respond to wildlife. Ever go out to the hill country and see an area that has been grazed by um, white-tailed deer, overgrazed perhaps by white-tailed deer? You'll see that there is nothing from about from about three inches off the ground to about five feet up in the uh, up in the air. And so we know that those plants have responded to the wildlife. And we know that wildlife respond to plants. Wildlife, some wildlife especially need certain plants in order to survive and reproduce. For example, the golden sheep warbler requires a mature ash juniper and oak woodland in order to survive. So we know that all these things work together. And we know that changing one thing will change other things. So we're never done. So I said that, as my preacher says, to say this, when we are creating an ecosystem, when we're creating a wildscape, we have to bring in an ecosystem frame of view and realize that if we want to garden for the benefit of songbirds and butterflies, we have to realize that many creatures play very specific and important parts in the ecosystem. So who knows what this is? Tell me in the chat window if you know what this um, critter is. Everybody's fumbling. Oh, where's the chat window? It's over on the right. Ooh, very good guess. It is a spider. Oh, and I see the person who sent that to me. Oh, banana spider. Well done, well done. <laughs> um, so some people call it a banana spider. Some people call it um, a black and yellow argiope or argiope. Um, and some people call it a zipper spider. And so people call it, like Daniel did, a banana spider, and what this, or a garden spider. And so all the spiders in this, um, in this particular group make that um, zigzag thing, right, that's going down through the middle of the web. And that zigzag thing is called a stabilimentum, and it performs a couple of different functions. One of them is to prevent, it, it's such a large web, it, it is a visual um, deterrent so that birds don't fly through it. I think is pretty cool. So why do I put it on there? Well, it is, uh, this particular spider is a female. I know it's female because she's huge. Uh, the male is usually very small and, and cowering up in the, in the top right of the web or the side of the web. And, um, uh, and, and anyway, the, the garden spider is very beneficial in that it will take down some of your largest garden um, pests, like the uh, oh, those awful grasshoppers that will eat everything in the garden. So it's important to remember that different things are uh, provide different benefits to your garden. And just because it's a little scary looking doesn't mean that it isn't playing a very important role. 
But when, we're, when we create a um, landscape like this, um, well, something that we consider something more traditional, we really banish all the creatures that once inhabited it. So if you notice this traditional garden, and it's, it's really only been a tradition since about the 1950s or maybe mid-40s, um, but when we create a garden like this, we really reduce the amount of diversity of plant species. If you look, I only see one, two, three, four, five, maybe six different species in here. You know, you see grass, you see, um, What's that called? The ryope down here, and the boxwood hedges, and probably a Japanese yew in there somewhere, and a ligustrum, um, and some philodendrons or something. But anyway, uh, things that that don't produce a whole lot of color, a whole lot of uh, nectar. Um, and what we've done is we've we've hedged and pruned and trimmed our garden into something that looks recognizable to us as um, as appropriate for a front garden but is really unrecognizable to most wildlife species. There are exceptions, though, because wildlife finds a way, doesn't it? So what kind of species do you think you might find here, you might actually find here? And in every program, somebody always mentions chinch bugs. That would be correct. You'll find chinch bugs in there. Any other guesses? I feel like I'm saying Bueller, Bueller. Well, I'll say. Okay, so um, anybody? Yes, absolutely. Ants, grasshoppers, and blue jays, yes. And one of the reasons you find those is because they are extreme generalist species. They do pretty well just about anywhere. And those are the species that we generally don't want to see a whole lot of. But in our urban areas, we tend to see a whole lot of them because they outcompete those species that need a little bit more. Um, diversity in their habitats. Other species you might find there are grackles. Uh, we've made excellent grackle habitat in our urban and suburban areas because what they need to survive is low-cut grass because that's where they display to their female, the males and females display on that low-cut grass. And then they need mature or almost mature trees um, in, in which to nest. So we've created this glorious grackle habitat and they can eat just about anything from um, grasshoppers to french fries and survive. So, um, of course, they're going to do pretty well in urbanized areas. Whenever we get mad at them for um, taking over the HEB parking lot, we should remember, well, you know what, we, we created this habitat for them. So it's uh, hard, to, hard to get too mad at them. Okay, and so when we create gardens like this, we, are, we remember that we are rewarded. And when we garden for caterpillars, things that we may not want to see eating down our, our plants, we're rewarded by butterflies. And we remember that it's not just good for wildlife, it's good for us too. It helps us remember. It helps us remember what real beauty is. This glorious creature is a painted bunting. This one happens to be a male. And they are native to central Texas. Um, they're, in fact, they're native to a lot of, of Texas. And you can have them in your yard if you plant the right things, if you provide them with some sunflowers, if you provide them perhaps with a with a feeder that's appropriate. But you can have you can see them and they are gorgeous. It helps us remember about real life. Um, when we were children, most of us, we had some sort of experience that allowed us to understand the cycle of life, life and death and birth. Um, in a way that was recognizable. But our children, a lot of times, have not gotten those same experiences because we keep them inside a lot more than we used to. So having these natural opportunities to explore these very big concepts is really, really beneficial. In fact, studies have shown that children who are separated from wildlife and natural activities have difficulty in developing um, impulse control isn't that crazy? Um, they have difficulty um, maintaining attention. They have a harder time understanding consequences. And they have a harder time understanding some um, concepts, some academic concepts like geometry and physics that we learn in a, na a very natural way when we play outside. So it's really important for us to remember that creating these natural spaces is not just a cool thing to do. 
because we happen to have the time to do it, is really an important part of being a human in our society today. It also helps us remember about real wonder. So if you remember the first time you saw something wondrous, it was probably something that had that was based in nature, whether it was a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis or uh, the birth of a child or or whatever, or the soaring of a, of a bird. Things that inspire wonder ra rarely come off of a, a screen, unless, of course, you're listening to a webinar through Texas Wildlife Association. Okay, so um, the first thing that folks want to do when they create wildlife habitat, because you're convinced, right, we're all in. We're going to do this. We're going to create wildlife habitat. The first thing most people want to do is put out feeders, and that's fantastic. Some of the most common ones that we put out are hummingbird feeders and songbird feeders like these. Um, hummingbirds are coming through, by the way. You should have seen a couple by now, and they might have fussed at you if you don't have your feeders up yet. And to put out a hummingbird feeder, of course, you want to put one part sugar to four parts water. You can boil it if you like. Um, or you don't have to. It kind of depends on how often you want to change it out. But be sure to change it out no less than once every two or three days because there's a fungus that can um, get in that fluid and it'll, it'll coat the tongue of the hummingbird and will cause death very, very quickly. So you want to make sure that you're providing a benefit and not harm to the, to the wildlife that you're hoping to attract. If you're looking for attracting seed-eating birds like chickadees and titmice and cardinals and things like that, Finches, house finches are crazy now. Um, also, American goldfinches, all these are real common feeder birds. If you're going to put out something, I would encourage you to put out black oil sunflower seed. That is um, black oil sunflower seed. And uh, it's also, there's also striped sunflower seed, which is um, a little bit easier to find sometimes, but is not, is not quite as good as the black oil. And the reason I recommend that is because it attracts the greatest variety of birds, the fewest pest species of birds, and also it's the easiest to crack open and has the most uh, uh, calories in the form of oil. So this is a really good seed to put out. But, you know, and, and we talk about feeders and you can do a whole books on feeding, feeding wildlife, but what we should remember is that feeding should always be a supplement and not the only source of nutrition for wildlife species. Um, we, sh we should be treating them as ways to get closer to wildlife, ways to get better pictures of wildlife if we like them, we like to do that, ways to um, experience them a little bit closer, but never a source of complete nutrition. We don't even know how to feed ourselves very well. <laughs> so we shouldn't think that we can provide the complete source of nutrition for wildlife. And I say that to say this, um, wildlife really require native species of plants in order to thrive. And so I thought I'd throw up a couple of different species of plants that are really good for wildlife in the majority of the place, uh, majority of Texas, is, but it's mostly central Texas. Um, of course, oak species, oak provides um, the mast or the, the acorns and the small twigs, the new growth twigs um, that many species of wildlife really depend on. Um, you have good years and bad years. But it's always, it's always a dependable food source for, for many wildlife species. Um, they also provide a substrate that is an area for wildlife to be. So they can um, uh, search for food in them. They can nest in them. They can do all sorts of things. But a big thing to remember is there are different oak species. There's not just live oaks. There's not just red oaks. But there's lacy oaks. Lacy oaks. Lacy oaks are fantastic for central Texas, especially if you've got some limestone in your soil. There are smaller oak tree. Um, there, there's a chin oak. There's all kinds of different oak species that are appropriate for central Texas as well as Texas at large. Another great tree, a smaller tree that's more appropriate for a suburban or urban lawn is a Mexican plum. Mexican plum provides a flush of blooms in early spring. They're, they're just about done blooming right now um, here in central Texas. But the blooms start off as white, uh, they fade off to pink, and then they um, drop, and then they produce a fruit that's a little plum. The plum is edible to humans as well as to the, the uh, ground. They'll start to decompose, and they will uh, provide a lot of really good nutrition to 
um, butterflies that you might not ordinarily see. So there are some butterflies that, that really adore rotting fruit. <laughs> Isn't that adorable? Rotting fruit, and, um, and so you can really attract them that way. But they provide a great early source of nectar. So for a variety of butterflies especially, but also other nectaring insects as well. And I see that there's a question about um, food source habitat plants for arid west Texas. So it's, it would be really difficult for me to do specialized um, recommendations for this. I tried to come up with some that were good for most of Texas. However, the book, Texas Wildscapes, Gardening for Wildlife, has them separated out by um, ecosystem. So that should be helpful. And also there's a book by Sally and Andy Wazowski. Um, and I'd like to be able to put that in. Let's see, I'm going to put it in here uh, in the chat. Room. Let's see, Sally and Andy Wazowski. And they have a number of different books. One of them is um, Native Texas Plants Gardening Region by Region. So they'll have very specific recommendations for gardens in, um, in all the different ecoregions of Texas, including um, arid West Texas. And one of the nice things I like, to, one of the things I like to do is take their book and combine it with my book. Um, their book really doesn't have anything on wildlife value, so but they are really, really good at knowing their plants. So the the first uh, the question was about the first book I mentioned that's Texas Wildscapes, and that's by uh, a woman you might know, me, <laughs> um, and through Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas A and M Press. Okay. So the Mexican plum is a small ornamental tree that is excellent for any wildscape. But there's a number of different varieties of plums, so you might look and see which one is most appropriate for your area. Agarita is one that'll do pretty well just about anywhere except for in, in very wet places. Agarita is a great alternative to a holly. So if you're looking for a like an English holly or a Christmas holly, this one gives great texture to it to a garden in appropriate areas it acts like a small shrub or a, a medium-sized shrub it can be trimmed into a variety of different shapes if you want it more thick and, and broad or you want it more open and tall it'll do either of those two things and you see the berries there that it produces it produces the berries in the spring and in fact they are fully ripe right now um, although they, they may have been eaten up pretty quickly because birds just adore them they eat them very very quickly what the birds don't eat, you might be able to use yourself. They make a great jelly, um, a very fine wine, I'm told also. But the other thing is those leaves. Look at those leaves. They're very, uh, very prickly. And they make a fantastic shelter for a number of different um, songbird species that re really require um, nest, or they really like to nest in very thorny or prickly habitats. So that, that reduces their susceptibility to predators, and the most common predators would be things like, well, house cats, um, honestly, and also snakes, like um, the uh, rat snake is a real common predator, too. So great food, great shelter. Oh, it also produces an early flush of, um, of flowers as well. So those are fantastic for early nectars in the early springtime. They're, they've completed their flowering for now. One thing that's kind of cool about them also is that they you oftentimes find them under fence rows, and of course there's a reason for that because birds adore them, and um, they so they oftentimes get planted underneath uh, barbed wire fences. So they're usually cursed by ranchers because they're always having to clear those um, those fence lines. But they're fantastic for for wildlife species. Another really reliable plant that you can use in, in a many different applications is the Turk's cap. Turk's cap is found, uh, used to be hard to find native plants but it, it, in the nurseries, but Turk's cap is one that you can find pretty reliable, reliably in almost any nursery. So it's a really good one to have, to know about. It is a great shade plant. It doesn't, doesn't look to me very um, attractive in bright sunlight, it gets kind of rough looking, but in uh, in a little with just a little bit of shade and a little bit of water, it is absolutely a gorgeous plant. 
It produces these little um, jewel-like red flowers that put their pollen way up top, way up high. And so if you notice, um, let's see if I can do these little things here. So the nectary, the where you find the nectar in the plant is down, uh, come here, where is it? Sorry, right there. Okay, so that's where the nectar is. And if you look, well, this is not Photoshop. <laughs> but anyway, so the distance from the nectary up to the top is about the same distance from the tip of a hummingbird's beak up to his forehead. So a lot of times when you see hummingbirds flying around and they've got yellow foreheads, these are hummingbirds that have been foraging around the Turk's cap. In fact, Turk's cap is pretty specialized to hummingbirds and, or to, uh, to being utilized by hummingbirds and large butterflies because of this very long nectar tube. They also produce a fruit. Uh, here's a green one right here, and there's a ripe red one down here. And the fruit is edible to humans. It's also edible to many species of wildlife. If you choose to eat it, know that it tastes a bit like wet styrofoam, but it's got a great um, ability to provide good carbohydrates um, if you're really hungry. Okay. So apparently songbirds adore um, hot food and chili pekin or chili patine is one of those species that they really, really like. Um, did you know that the hot in peppers is, called, uh, is caused by the chemical capsaicin? And capsaicin is, is detectable by mammals. So mammals like humans and dogs and um, raccoons and things like that, they can detect the hot of the pepper, but birds cannot. And so that is pretty cool. It helps us know that um, the, the peppers defend themselves against mammalian predators, but favor avian predators. Because what happens is when an avian, when a bird will eat the pepper, it'll digest the, the fruit around the, the seed deposit the seed in um, fertilizer <laughs> and plant the plant along uh, and spread the plant. It is a fantastic and ornamental plant. I think it does best in shade um, where it's got a real open lacy growth habit, but it will do well in sunshine also. It just, when it's in the sun, it makes a more dense plant. And it, um, I, I don't think the peppers, really are as ornamental in that way. Okay, if you, like me, and <laughs> sometimes um, have a brown thumb and you have a difficulty growing new plants or um, any plants, this is the plant for you. This is scarlet sage. And I'm gonna give you the scientific name for it too. It's salvia coccinia. And I'm just gonna put it in the chat window. I know we're gonna not using that too much, but salvia coccinia. And the reason I'm putting it here is because we've got a whole lot of cultivars of scarlet sage. Scarlet sage doesn't need any cultivars. It is a fantastic plant all on its very native own. Um, it's a great plant for larger butterflies, but also for hummingbirds and even seed eating, small seed eating birds like American goldfinch. So what the American so it's a it's a prolific seeder and so what it'll do is that the goldfinch will um, start at the bottom of the flower stalk and work its way up in the little capsules of seeds eating the little seeds and then moving up all the way up to the top until it can't the plant can't support its weight anymore and then it flutters over to the next one. It's a ton of fun to watch. I love watching it. But anyway, I was telling you how easy it is to grow, and it is. Um, I don't ever buy these plants in the four-inch pots or certainly not in the half gallons or anything because they are so easy to grow by seed. You go get yourself a packet of seeds, spread them out. You'll have germination within a week and you'll have flowers within a couple of weeks. It's just an amazing little plant. And if you want, so it gets up to about two and a half feet or so, but if you like, you can line trim it or even mow it at the very, very highest setting um, and have yourself a ground cover that blooms. So it's fantastic for nectar, it's fantastic for seeds. Um, it's a great plant all around.
Okay, so mostly I've been talking about flowering plants, but there are other plants that are really beneficial in the garden as well and add a lot of great texture. So if you um, are familiar, familiar with pampas grass, you know that pampas grass can add a lot of impact in, a, in an area. Of course, pampas grass can also be used as a hedge or shade, but pampas grass is really susceptible to creating a fire risk, and it's also not native. So it's not a great plant to use in a wildlife habitat garden. However, we do have a wonderful plant that can be used in the same kind of way. It's called Lindheimer muley, or big muley. And big muley is, uh, can get about three feet tall, and it makes these great, beautiful power puff kind of statements in your garden. And I've used it in my home in place of a hedge, um, uh, the foundation planting around the, the base of my foundation because I think it is a prettier, softer um, kind of thing to have around my foundation. I think it, it provides rhythm and it provides texture in my garden, but it also provides a habitat for lots of different grassland nesting birds and also the material for seeds or the material for nests. So whenever I open up my bluebird boxes, they always have a ton of Lindheimer muley um, grass and seed heads and things. Um, forming a large part of the nest. Okay, so why is it that I'm talking about native plants almost, ex well, exclusively and not exotic species? Because there are a lot of exotic species that people know are very thrifty with their water use and can be used in a, in technically a zero escape yard, um, but are not recommended when we're talking about wildlife. And there's a reason for that. That is because, in my view, exotic species tend to fall into one of two groups. Either they're needy or they're weedy. Needy species require lots of chemicals, supplemental water, constant vigilance, anything that has a whole society dedicated to its care and feeding um, is, is something that I don't need in my yard. <laughs> um, I prefer to give the water in my, in my, uh, out of my hydrant to my, my children not to my grass, that's for sure. And then those things that are not needy tend to be pretty weedy. Weedy species have rapid reproduction, they have no natural controls, and they have a tendency to take over habitat. So if you think about Chinese tallow, for example, Chinese tallow was imported, obviously, from Asia. It was imported into the Northeast first for agriculture because it makes a great uh, wax that's used in candles. But when it was brought to South the southern United States, um, it began to exhibit really weedy characteristics. It reproduced very rapidly. It had no natural controls, and it started to take over habitat. And in fact, if you travel from Texas to Louisiana, the only fall color you'll see is from lots and lots and lots of Chinese tallow. Once they get into an environment, they can change it from a wet, uh, meadow into a dry upland in the span of five or seven years. It is an incredible plant that, that really um, can take over habitat. And those species that take over habitat have a tendency to support other wildlife species that take over habitat. And that, this is a um, European starling. It's uh, obviously an import from Europe. And it is a very aggressive nest interloper. So it'll take over cavity nesting species nests. So a lot of times you ha hear of people who are having trouble with European starlings or also European um, house finches. And those species are both imports. They're both generalistic. They do pretty well just about anywhere. And so they outcompete other species that need specific conditions in order to survive. Okay, so I've talked about food, right, pretty extensively for a wildlife garden. Let's talk about the other two elements, water and shelter. Water can be provided in a variety of different ways, but there are a couple of different characteristics that they need to share, and that is they need to be fresh and clean. That is, you don't want to let uh, algae grow, you know, completely take over the area. Uh, the fresh water will reduce your problems with any kind of uh, waterborne pests, especially mosquitoes. You want it to be accessible. So you want it to not have those straight up and down sides. You want to have a little bit of a, a beach area so that things that don't swim very well can access it. So for example, I used to get wildscape applications all the time. And I used to get occasionally an application that will use 
their water source as a uh, number three tub, you know, those galvanized metal tubs, or a bucket for the water. And while that's really great for your dog or maybe white-tailed deer, it's not very good for many other species of, of um, animals like birds and toads and, um, and other critters because it's just not accessible. And key, in, um, key to accessibility is that there's a little bit of a shallow area. So the shallow area might evaporate and then refill frequently. What that'll do is provide some uh, salts and other minerals that will be valuable to different species, especially butterflies. If you've ever seen butterflies congregate to a little puddle, a, little, a shallow area, what they're doing is they're getting water a little bit, but mostly what they're doing is they're gathering those minerals and salts that they present to their females as a nuptial packet or a gift that will help her as she lays her eggs um, after she's been fertilized. So anyway, um, that shallow area is essential for a number of different species, but especially things like songbirds and butterflies and uh, lizards and toads and things like that. There also needs to be appropriate vegetation. So know that vegetation should be there and allow the wildlife to, um, to escape to, for cover, but know also that the vegetation can hide predators. So you don't want it to completely surround the, the water feature. You want it to um, hide some areas, but not, other, not completely surround it. Okay, and so the, the final element for habitat is shelter. Shelter is required for all wildlife, for adults and for young, for protection from weather and from predators. And these little guys are my very favorite bird. Do you, do you, does anybody know what they are? Oh, we haven't done the participation thing in a while, so, and I see there's plenty of questions and we'll address them. Martin, that's a really good guess, it's close. Swallows, swallows is the one I was looking for. And in fact, this one, it's a little hard to, it may be a little hard to tell, but you see they got the little chestnut on the, ne the neck and on the um, forehead and then kind of a forked tail down here. And that split in the tail is what lets me know absolutely that this is a barn swallow. It, exactly, there, Anne's got it. A barn swallow, um, that, and barn swallows are getting, seem to be more and more common nesting underneath eaves and overhangs in urbanized areas. Um, I love them. They can eat a ton of insects every single day. And um, while they might seem to be aggressive, they might kind of dive on you a little bit, they never, ever, there's never ever been anybody hurt by these little tiny birds with the little diminutive little beaks. What they're trying to do is scare you away from hurting their babies. Um, but of course you would never, nobody would ever harm babies that are, that are in this uh, talk, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, anything that would, so a lot of times what we put out for, um, for wildlife are nest boxes. And these are a fantastic way to increase the wildlife habitat value of your area and increase the amount of shelter available. But not every uh, nest box is appropriate for use in a wildscape. If something that looks, if something looks very decorative or very interesting or cute, that's usually a nest box that needs to go in your house <laughs> rather than out for birds. So anything that has a license plate for a roof or, uh, or is made out of a mosaic of glass or, or anything like that, those things are really cool um, uh, discussion pieces inside your house, but they're not great for birds. The things that make a really good nest box for birds are, are these little factors, and I'll, I'll look at them real quick. The, the material, that it's made of should be untreated and unpainted, especially on the inside. So this nest box is uh, made of untreated cedar, and that is, a, or, yeah, untreated cedar, and it's rough cut cedar, and that allows the little uh, babies when they're inside a little bit more footing as they're trying to climb outside. That rough cut is great for that. But also it's untreated and yet it's pest resistant because of the natural aromatic oils in the cedar. Also notice that it's got this, um, screw right there, what that allows you to do is to open it up at the end of the season, flip open the, the nest box and clean it out because you want to make sure to get out all those materials every year um, to reduce any kind of pest infestations. Notice also it's got this great big long roof and overhang. That's to prevent, well certainly it's to, to provide protection from the sun, but it's also to prevent predators from getting inside that nest box. 
So predators have a hard time reaching over and around and up to get into the nest box opening there. So this, this little uh, drain cap here, the little um, thing that they've got there, and then the long overhang, and then the block right here, um, is a, th those are all predator deterrent systems. Also, you notice they've created lots of ventilation areas in the nest box, and that prevents overheating. Um, you know, our nest boxes can get really, really hot in the summertime. And what you can't see, but what you could see if it was, if the, if I could tilt this picture over a little bit, is that down here there's some holes that are drilled in order to allow any rain that does get in to drain out so that there's no puddling um, and no rotting of vegetation inside, inside the nest box. Also notice this little bluebird has got something in his beak, doesn't he? He's got a little caterpillar. So we know that if, um, if you want to support nesting birds, you need to also support the things that they eat. So we need to be careful about indiscriminate use of, use of pesticides, because if you use pesticides indiscriminately, especially far away from your home, um, around in your gardens, then that increases the chances that a bird is going to eat that pesticide-ridden insect. Um, and of course, that's not good for her, him, or their babies, their, ch their chicks. Okay, so anything that would be nesting in a nest box would really rather be nesting in a cavity of a standing dead tree or a snag. And a standing dead tree or a snag is a fantastic way to provide not only nesting areas, but also feeding areas. So those standing dead trees have um, wood that is getting softer and softer by the burrowing of larvae, insect larvae, beetles, also lower down fungi, and maybe even some salamanders and centipedes and spiders and all kinds of things. And all those things are great for wildlife uh, to feed on and to exist with. So if you have a standing dead tree or a snag that's far away from the house, that's not going to do any damage if it happens to fall, you might consider leaving it up rather than taking it down right away because it's extremely valuable to wildlife species. So that's all there is to it. Habitat is food, water, and shelter, shelter for adults and for young. And by providing that with native plants and also other supplemental structures that, is, that enhance your habitat. And you can have it in any way, whether it's the more natural aesthetic that you saw earlier with the Spanglo's yard or this more formal um, European kitchen, cottage garden, the white picket fence ideal. It's appropriate as well. Because we're the government and we're here to help, we have uh, some resources for you. I mentioned earlier the book, Texas Wildscapes Gardening for Wildlife. Um, that's me at the bottom there. Um, this is a really good resource for understanding how plants can provide habitat for wildlife and different requirements for different beneficial wildlife species, how to live in, uh, in harmony with wildlife, and how to deter any sort of pest species. Um, we've got this book out. I also recommend the, Waz the book by the Wazowskis. Um, to work as a companion piece. And once you've started creating your wildscape, we want to be sure to reward your hard work and recognize it. So we have the Texas Wildscapes Backyard Wildlife Habitat Certification Program. The certification form is free and online. You can find it at Texas Parks and Wildlife's web page. Um, just Google Texas Wildscape Certification and you'll find it. The certification itself is free. You'll receive a certificate when you've told us how you provided food, water, shelter, and 50% or more uh, native plants. And then you'll also be eligible to purchase the sign. I think it's 10 or $15. It's just to recoup our, our cost in printing it. But the sign can be posted in your, in your yard or garden as a way of starting conversations with your neighbors. Also, we work in partnership with the National Wildlife Federation to provide a Best of Texas Wildlife Habitat Program. The Best of Texas Wildlife Habitat Program is a partnership that combines the best of both certification programs. And so you can apply with just one application to both of our programs. I think there's a question slide later, but I'm going to go ahead. That's my contact information. I'm going to go ahead and put it at the very last slide so that we can remind you that uh, those horn plate, horn lizard plate, uh, license plates, sorry, that you see running around Texas are supporting wildlife conservation through Texas Parks and Wildlife and our partners. And you can buy them at any time, regardless of what time, you, what 
what place you are in your registration cycle, they're $30, and 22 of that goes directly to conservation projects. You can find out exactly what kind of projects that we um, fund with those on our website as well. We've got the website right there. So, um, Eleanor, I think uh, now is the time for questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, um, please post them in the chat window. And the first one that I've got here, um, it asks, what is the best seed for Rio Grande wild turkey and bobwhite quail? Oh, gosh, turkey and quail. So turkey and quail um, will come to, of course, any of your the crack corn feeders that you put out for deer, generally speaking. But, of course, I really recommend using wildlife habitat management um, principles to create really good balanced wildlife habitats. You're not going to see a whole lot of quails coming to a, quail coming to a feeder. But you will see them if you provide lots of um, a large acreage of bunch grasses rather than turf grasses, uh, along with scattered shrubs. And that works well for turkey as well, uh, but they, they prefer a little bit more woodland habitat available also. But the biggest thing for quail are those bunch grasses. So you want to look out for things like little blue stem, um, side oats grandma, big blue stem, Indian grass. Um, and switch grass, and those grasses will provide really, really good wildlife habitat, especially for quail. But we have uh, publications for uh, turkey and quail online. If you go to the Texas Parks and Wildlife website, or you just Google um, quail or uh, Rio Grande wild turkey and Texas Parks and Wildlife together, you'll find all our publications. All right, thank you. Um, the next question I see here, um, someone says, we recycle our washing machine water and use it for water in the yard. Will this have an adverse effect for these plants? Oh, no. So, well, uh, the biggest thing that you'll want to be, that's a great idea, and it's something that I uh, have done in the past, and I, I think it's a great idea for reusing and recycling your water. Um, the one thing you want to be concerned about is what kind of soap that you're using in your laundry. So you want to be sure to be using low nitrogen soap. You want to be using things, uh, a soap that decomposes readily. And there are a number of different products on the market that will do just that. Um, so, yeah, great idea, good use of, of water resources. Okay, the next question, what is the best time to put out nest boxes for bluebirds? so that other small birds, which nest earlier in the year, do not get to the boxes too soon? Oh, very good question. Okay, so there are a number of different ways to um, to address that difficulty with the, with the early pioneers coming in and taking over the nest boxes. So I, I really, as long as they're native, I, I gotta say I don't really mind um, other, I, I don't care who uses the next nest box. It's, Somebody else comes in, I usually put up another nest box, except for those um, exotic species, those house sparrows and European starlings, and I pick them out pretty quick. So, but what time of year, I usually put mine out in uh, the middle of February um, here in Central Texas. There might be other recommendations. I would look at the Texas Bluebird Society for specific recommendations based on your county, um, but those, but that'll give you a good round estimate. Okay, great. Uh, the next question we have says, we are establishing many plots of perennial Maximilian sunflowers on our ranch to provide seed for songbirds. What would be some other good perennials that would be good food plots for songbirds? Oh, wow. Excellent question. Okay, so the the native, the sunflowers, and I, I think you said Maximilian sunflower? Is that what you said? Yes. Um, Maximilian sunflower is fantastic. There are a number of different um, sunflower type species that I would also complement that with. But so birds are eating um, seed, so, but they're also requiring, gosh, it kind of depends on what kind of bird you're trying to attract. So if you're looking for grassland nesting birds, which is kind of what you're going to get with the sunflowers, and you're certainly going to get uh, painted buntings as well, but also dick thistles and uh, probably dove, different types of dove, morning dove, probably white winged dove too. Um, and um, 
Inkadove as well, probably. And then um, metal arcs, gosh, I, I would increase, I would be sure that you're not putting out just the sunflowers and ensure that you're putting out some native grasses as well. So a nice diverse mixture of those. And then also think about putting out some shrubs along the margins that provide fruit. So those ag so if you're talking about out on a ranch, you probably already got agarita, but I would check it out, make sure you've got some good agarita out there. Um, and anything that provides a fruit or a nut would, would also be good. And of course, the you know, I guess I, I feel like I often get the question, you know, what particular species I can put out, and I think, well, there's a ton. <laughs> and um, it kind of depends on what your aesthetic is and what you're looking for. So check the book out. There's, um, they're available through the most li I, we sent one out to every library in the state of Texas. So you should be able to check one out for free if you don't want to ha uh, have to go buy it. Um, and also it has a DVD in the back. The DVD has a searchable database. So what you do is you tell it what characteristics of plant you're looking for. So you're looking for songbird um, species. You're looking for species that um, will do well in, in Mason County, for example, that are songbird species that uh, bloom in the summertime. And it will spit you out a list of species that fulfill those requirements. And so what you can do then is, is select different species, put them in your garden park, and, and print out that result and keep it for your files as you're making your, your purchasing decisions for the next uh, several months. Okay. okay. Go mm -hmm. ahead. No, go ahead. I was like, we have we have another question. Um, mm -hmm. It says, is sumac a desirable plant for wildlife? It seems very prolific. Oh, absolutely. So I'm assuming you mean flame leaf sumac because that's the one that's very prevalent um, in, in many areas of the state. Absolutely. It's produces um, a, like a big cone of seed and lots of different wildlife species, especially songbirds, adore that seed and, and use it quite quite a bit. So yeah, it is really good. One of the reasons it's so prolific is because birds will eat the seed and spread the seed. So it's a great plant. I love it. And it is not, as some people were worried about um, whether sumac is the poison sumac. No, it's not at all. Okay, great. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Oh, there is one more. Oh, um, there is. There is yeah. one more. I had scrolled down. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the book I actually, let me go copy my links earlier. I posted them a little while ago, and I'm going to recopy that and post it oh, okay. here. The title of the book is Texas Wildscapes Gardening for Wildlife. It's through Texas A&M Nature Guides, and it's available through many different outlets, one of which is Amazon.com. Yeah, but there's so those, those links for Amazon, but yeah, like you said, um, that's just the fastest one I could find for both of those that <laughs> you mentioned. Yeah, and it's about, it's about, oh, it's, it ranges from about 16 to $22. Okay. 